Hey, everybody, this is Jeremy Carlson, and you are listening to the Bluegrass Sports Performance Podcast. Today, we are talking with Coach Joe Taranzo, the strength and conditioning coach at St. Xavier High School. Coach, how are we doing today? Good, Jeremy. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well. Coach, uh, share with our listeners a little bit about your background, where you're from, and how you got to where you are today. Yep. So, uh, born and raised here in Louisville. Um, I, you know, I've been a St. X kid my whole life. Uh, dad went here, graduated in 76. And I remember, uh, you know, going to St. X football games on Friday nights over, over there at Manual Stadium ever, ever since I can remember, uh, you know, being bundled up at, uh, you know, at, uh, what is that? A Christmas story where the kid has like three different jackets on, can't put his arms down. So I kind of picture myself of, uh, uh, being that kid over uh, over at the games and uh, uh, going over there to old old Cardinal Stadium, uh, watching some state championships there. So uh, I graduated here uh, uh, 2005. Um, so again, green and gold my whole life. Uh, went to uh, went to Louisville, uh, walked on, uh, played football at uh, Louisville uh, there for five years. Um, had uh, had a short stint, uh, had a little practice squad time with the Cincinnati Bengals, um, uh, got cut essentially, uh, and then uh, uh, went with the uh, Tennessee Titans uh, camp and got the old uh, coach needs to see you play or bring your playbook uh, script that you see on Hard Knocks. And uh, after that, man, it was time to go back out uh, into the real world. Um, and so I opened up my own, uh, along with uh, Greg, uh, Greg Frederick, um, opened up um, own private facility. Uh, and then a couple years into that, this position uh, came available. So uh, for St. X, this position that I hold was just kind of started in uh, 2013, um, you know, and, uh, and uh, I was the first hire. So that's kind of the the, the road that uh, uh, led me to that uh, in a little bit of a, an abbreviated version. Nice, awesome. Well, it's it's, it's great to see people that uh, end up going back to their hometown or their their school that they went to. And it sounds like you've got a long tradition of St. X that kind of runs through through your blood. And if anybody knows anything about Kentucky and Louisville, the question that people always ask is, "What school did you go to?" And they're yep. not asking what college. No. You went to. No, they're not. It, uh, it, it's yeah. Where are you go here in Louisville, here in Louisville at least, and I can only speak to that. Born, and raised here, but yeah, like you were saying, if somebody asks where you go to school, it, high school. Where would you it's go? High school. school. It's high school. Yeah. Where did you go to high? When did you graduate? They're not asking college. High school. Oh, so, they're, figuring, they're figuring out high school there. Well, that's that's awesome that that you have that deep connection to the school, and I'm sure that makes it even more a little bit more meaningful to you uh, when when you sit down because you can see yourself in a lot of these kids. Yeah, and, and that's one thing that I think really helps in being able to create uh, kind of that uh, buy-in that we talk about with our athletes is, you know, I myself can sit there and say, look, I, I was you. You know, I was there. I was sitting in that classroom, right? When the kids say, oh, coach, man, uh, you know, I'm like, hey, you, you need to shave. And you're like, oh, but like, hey, man, I was there. Like the principal, I just told the story this morning. I said the principal – was checking me like every other day to make sure that I shaved, mm -hmm. you know? So like, I get it. I understand. I was there, you know, pay your dues, get through it. Um, but, you know, coaches, we talk about getting that buy-in all the time. And so I, I, I think that is something that, you know, really helps me is being able to say, Hey, I was, I was there in the shoes. You know, and then uh, having having some of our coaches who were my coaches when I was here, uh, the things that I talk about, uh, you know, the hard work, effort, attitude, all of those things, you know, I can say, hey, Coach Glazer, you know, hey, Coach Bruner, like those are those are guys who, uh, hey, Coach Walsh, like those are guys who coached me so they can verify, like, Coach Ronzo, he he's not BSing, man, like he's – he no that that happened. Yeah. Um. So that you know. So that's um. Uh, that that's an added bonus of uh, of I think being there at the alma mater and 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 some of the teachers as well. Some of the teachers who taught me are still here. Mm -hmm. Um. So being able to uh, talk and connect and I think sometimes um, you know a lot of us coaches like we just kind of get pegged as oh that's just the guy in the weight room you know that's the meathead. Yep. Uh, I refer to myself our weight rooms in the basement. 
Uh, so I refer, refer to myself as sometimes that, you know, that, that troll under the bridge, right? Yeah. And, um, but being able to go and having had those previous relationships with those teachers, uh, you know, they can kind of see a little bit more uh, than that. Being able to say, oh, you know, yeah, he, he, he was in my class. He did fine and all that. So um, it, it makes it a it makes it a fun environment. And it was definitely a weird dynamic than sitting in the teacher's lunchroom the first time I came back. Oh, I, oh, I it felt a little awkward, like, uh, hold on, am I going to get detention for that? No, wait, I, I actually work here now. Okay, yeah, that's, that's I, fine. I, I, I can imagine. I, I bet that is a, an odd feeling. I did it at, at the college level, but at the high school level, I'm sure it's an even different, uh, different thing to think about. So tell me a little bit about why you got into strength and conditioning. Right. So you have this football background. Uh, you could have easily continued with that and gone into being a sports coach for football and different things like that. But you chose the weight room. Talk to us a little bit about uh, I think you still maybe hold some records at St. X for uh, mm -hmm. some, some lifting. So yeah. I, I know it was something that you were an early adopter of even in high school. But explain to us kind of that process, why you gravitated towards the weight room. Yeah. So I, 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 I wanted to be a teacher. And at first I thought I wanted to be a history teacher. So when I went to college, I was actually a history major. Uh, and then I took my first history class and was absolutely bored out of my mind. I mean, I went, I went to class. I, I, I did it. Um, but I sat there and I was like, look, man, like if, if, I, if I can't be excited for like what I would be teaching, how the hell am I going to expect like my kids to be excited about this? Yep. Um and so that was kind of like the aha moment where even though that class was miserable, it really helped kind of change my uh, uh, trajectory was what was I passionate about? And it was about the weight room. Um, and I was a person who, as I said earlier, I had to walk on mm -hmm. at, at Louisville. Um, so even though like I was a first team all state guy here, I was uh, a three time shot put state champ here. Like, I didn't achieve those things because of, like, my God-given talent. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I was given genetic ability, but I had to tap into it. Like, I, I wasn't that guy who just walked out on the field and was the best guy out on the field. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't start on our freshman team as a freshman. You know, so what did I do? I hit the weight room. I gained 20 pounds from freshman to sophomore year. I hit the weight room. I gained 40 pounds from uh, uh, sophomore to junior year. And this isn't me going from 5'7 to 6'5. I mean, I'm sitting here at 5'10 and a half. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then I gained like another uh, 15 pounds. So the reason why I was able to accomplish those things was not because of just God-given athletic ability. And again, going back to what we talked about with having coaches here is I can say, hey, Coach Glazer, how how like good of an athlete I was. Exactly. Not very. Right. So getting these kids to buy into that and being able to say, look, man, like I did it like this is how I did it. So I think being passionate about that and loving that uh, dad always taught me, you know, son, if you if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. And that always stuck with me that. um <laughs> yeah, I don't want to teach history every single day. No. Like I'm sitting here in class and I could care less about ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Um, so I was like, what am I passionate about? I'm passionate about the weight room. I'm, I'm passionate about performance. Like the reason why at that time I'm at UofL as a sophomore, I think the reason why I'm even in this situation is because of all the work I put in. Like th this is what I want to, uh, this is what I want to go into. Um, you know, and and again, thank goodness for that uh, boring history class that I had to sit through. Well, it, it's funny. It's uh, I actually didn't know that about you, so that I got to learn something. And I love doing these podcasts because I get to learn uh, more about people. But I was actually a history major at Center College too, so I yeah. that we've got that connection. I did the same thing. I got done with my history, and I went all the way through the four years. And I got done with it. I went well. What do I do now? <laughs> right, and I, I had the option. And what do you do as a history major? You either go be a teacher or yep. you know, like explore the lawyer route and I, I looked at it and I was like I don't want to do either one of those yeah, I don't want to do either yeah I'm not ready for any of that so uh that that's awesome I, that, it's great to kind of see the path and I, I I believe too you had a mentor of sorts while you were at the UofL and he, you got to be coached underneath him and everybody knows his name but Joe Ken um mm. how did that kind of impact how you how just 
how you saw the strength and conditioning world, not necessarily programming, but just kind of maybe his passion that he brought to it. Did it help mm-hmm. help out with that decision? Yeah, and, and, and very fortunate. Again, we had uh, Jason Belkamp, who uh, I think currently is still the uh, head strength and conditioning coach at uh, Western Kentucky. Um, you know, he he was at uh, uh, at some other places as well, uh, Utah beforehand. Um, so, I, again, I was very, very fortunate to have during my five year stint there. Like now that I look back, I'm like, holy crap, I had like an all star cast of strength and conditioning coaches. So uh, Veltkamp, uh, 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 Coach Saha, who uh, went out to uh, University of Washington, and he was there with uh, Chris Peterson. He went to Boise and then Washington with um, uh, with Chris Peterson. Um, I had Joe Connolly, who went, and he was he's currently still at uh, uh, Arizona State with Herm Edwards. Uh, went with Adam Fight, who I think now is kind of more so in um, – like the 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 uh, private uh, route, but he was the uh, youngest head strength and conditioning coach uh, when he was head coach at Eastern Michigan. He was like twenty three years old. Um, you know, I had Brian Dermody who who uh, was with the New York Jets and uh, uh, did some things with um, uh, with Iowa. Um, and so, you know, and and I'm sure I, and I'm sure I'm uh, missing guys as well. But you know, you you take you take um, that group. You know, I, I think Coach Ken has a picture, and it, it it's like of those, uh, you know, of the five guys who were there, like all of them became um, head head coaches. Eddie Grayer, who is with the St. Louis Rams now, I believe he could be at Rutgers. I know he, he he's gone and done those. So you you had one picture. And it was Joe Ken and it was the four assistants who were there. And like all of them are head guys. Mm-hmm. And so, again, looking back, like you don't know it then, yeah. uh, but just to see how fortunate I was with that. Um, and it, what was nice is that as you're studying and as you're going to class and you're learning about these things in uh, human health and performance, and then you're going and you're doing your workout as an athlete, I was I, I was able to start kind of putting the picture together and say that's why we're doing this or I see we're doing this for that or okay I, I see why we're you know doing these clusters or I understand you know why we're doing these jumps here and kind of understanding the tier system and 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 training through it mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know even though some of the things that he had us do were horrible as far as terribly painful Mm -hmm. um you could put the pieces together and understand okay this is what we're doing while we're doing it Mm -hmm. right while we're not just running gassers the whole time we're actually doing okay we're going to do a 12 play segment and then switch in when we're doing our team conditioning and then while we started out with two minute runs in the summer and then slowly uh, kind of got rid of those, um, you know, to, to more of a, of a traditional football play style type of uh, conditioning session. Um, so that was that was a benefit that I was able to uh, to kind of live as a as a student I was able to do my internship and work with and being a being a senior captain, I was able to then kind of use my internship time working through him to do some of the block zero training, some of the movement training with our incoming freshmen who were my teammates. And so that was a very, uh, got unconventional uh, type of, you know, experience, uh, but one that I was uh, very fortunate to be a part of. Talk to me a little bit about what that, that internship block zero uh, kind of, look like for you and how it might have helped you especially with now working with the high school uh population that you do how impactful that was because it sounds like it was a great opportunity you know like you said connecting the the theoretical that you were learning in class to the practical that you were getting while you were actually training but then to actually start transitioning that and then being an intern and working with guys that are just coming out of high school. Now you're going to work with U of L. You're going to get good athletes, but I'm sure you see quite a few commonalities, even with some of your U of L athletes that are coming in. Maybe some of them haven't been in the weight room before. They're great athletes, right? They maybe haven't been in a weight room before, just like you're going to get a 14 year old in at St. X who probably has never been in a weight room before. So you probably yeah. have an opportunity to talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I think, and, and that was a big learning curve. Like you said, if, if I am, 
again, as a college senior, working with uh, the incoming freshmen coming in, they might be raw, but you can say like one thing and that thing is fixed. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, even though they are raw, their ability to have control of their own body, you know, it, it really, it helped because it helped because it hurt me. And, and, and let me say that by, you know, I think we're all kind of formed by a lot of the mistakes that we make. And one thing that I got spoiled and used to was either making corrections with our incoming freshmen or training around guys who are division one and then pro athletes was it kind of spoils you a little bit, right? It, it makes you say, Oh man, I mean, I can, I can say one thing and this thing is easily fixed. Mm -hmm. And then you come to that 14 year old who can't walk and chew gum at the same time. And you're like, wait, hold on that. Okay, I, I I said that same thing to this guy at work. It 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 doesn't work now. So um, that was tough for me. I think that was one of the one of those big learning curves was coming uh, to high school, and you know, not trying to toot my own horn here, toot our horn, but Saint X were were pretty good in all athletics, mm -hmm. right? In Kentucky, Saint X like on the boys' side, we're either competing in everything or winning everything. And so I think that when I came here, I was thinking in my mind, all right, what the guys I trained with and looked like when we were back here. Yeah. Well, I got spoiled from that because, you know, I was a blue collar guy. You know, I, I was all about lifting weights and I was fortunate enough to have teammates who were in the same boat. Like we all loved lifting weights and we were all about it. And we were, I think, somewhat good athletes, right? So when you come back here, I was like, okay, well, this is what we did. Like we were able to do it. Like we did a great job at it. And then you come back and be like, oh, okay, the, the, the kids who are here now are not the same type of kids that were on my team mm -hmm. or what I think of when we were, you know, when I think of some of my classmates. Yeah. And so kind of that culmination of remembering, hey, this is what I did. These were the guys I around. This is what a freshman should be expected to do. Mm -hmm. And also having just left college and pro where everyone's a division one athlete, no matter how raw they are, they're really friggin' athletic oh, yeah. um, and easily coached. You know, if you need to correct something, it gets done usually like right that second um, from an ability standpoint yeah. um, to coming back now to kids who are um, much more specialized in their sport. So more specialization, less generalization. Um, was a was a steep learning curve um, and one that, I mean, really I'm thankful for because uh, I think it made me a better overall coach. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that, that kind of transitions, transitions us into the next part there. Talk to me a little bit about what uh, St. X looks like. Again, if you're from Kentucky, you've got the general idea, right? You guys do compete. I mean, I, if I can recall, again, taking in a lot of kids that were at center, you know, great football program. Um, you know, you and Trinity are the ones that kind of go back and forth within the 6A realm. Uh, but you look across the board, you look at swim and dive. I don't know if you've, like, lost a state championship in, like, 30 years. I think it's 39 years or yeah, something I mean, ridiculous. Crazy. Uh, but talk to us a little bit about just St. X generally, not just that from a uh, – not from a, uh athletic perspective solely, but talk to us about just St. X – um, and then just because this is going to set us up a little bit for when we start talking about your program, because I think these are important things to understand in the context of how you program. So talk. To right. You. Yeah. So kind of starting with with what you talked about is, again, that was that trap that I fell into was. And I think that anybody really could fall into or or, or kind of uh, project out to is, you know, we won state football last year, swimming, lacrosse. We've won the last. Uh, 
what is it, five or something like that. Uh, baseball, we've won three out of the last six or four out of the last eight or something like that. Um, you know, track and field, we've been first or, or second. So when you start looking at, like, the championships, you're like, wow, these kids are elite. I mean, they are, you know, like, this is the best of the best of Kentucky. And, and, and that's great when it comes to the sport itself. Now, you know, and most coaches who are watching this know that just because a kid is good out on the field, when you break him down, could be fundamentally just garbage. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of made the mistake of, again, coming here with my experience as a St. X kid. And with the perception of, oh, well, we win all these gym, we got all these great athletes. And whenever I call our guys athletes, I usually do that, mm -hmm. is falling into that trap of, oh, man, all right, fellas, we're going we're gonna to do back squat today. Go. Like, this is going to be great. And then you're like, oh, oh, crap. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to do RDLs today. Okay, let me see that hip pin. Oh, wow. Okay. That's that. All right. That's also really bad. Okay. Uh, we're going to lunch. All right. So great story. Like I had a kid who was, you, you know, he was a wrestler and uh, this was like kind of back when I first got here and our wrestling coach was like, man, this guy's strong. He's all this, all this. And I had him do a split squat and he couldn't stand up. So he could sit there and deadlift or squat 400 pounds or what have you, but couldn't split squat 95 pounds, getting his knee to the ground and not stumbling over himself. So, again, to, to project that out there to anybody who might be listening when they look say next, like when I'm telling you that we have good players, that doesn't mean we have good fundamental athletes or, or you know, uh, uh, and have that base of athleticism. Mm -hmm. And that's what I try to instill in our guys is keeping things very, very general because that's really what they're lacking. Mm -hmm. I mean, their sports specific skill is very good. I mean, the best in the state, um, but still that struggle with the, you know, with the, with the basement. Our roof is great. Our roof is great. Our basement of our house is what's always under construction. Yeah, um, you, you, you almost yeah. got an inverted pyramid, right? Like, you, yeah. You oh, I think every, I think everybody does. Yeah. I think yeah. everybody does. It's not just us. Um, now I think we might have it more so than a lot of people because, you know, we're, it costs 15 grand to go to school here. Our family, I'm not going to try to hide from it. Like our families have a lot of disposable income, which means they got a lot more ability to be able to play club and travel and do all that than maybe some other uh, kids from other schools who, who can't. Mm -hmm. And hey, that, that's awesome. I was thinking about that the other day while I was watching my kids play on the playground. And I was like, man, these, my boys right now playing on this playground are getting more athletic development than that kid who is going to go travel to Indianapolis and play uh, two soccer games. I was like, this is awesome. I'll just bring them up here. They're climbing, they're jumping, they're, they're rolling, they're sliding, they're doing all that. And I'm like, perfect. This is great. So to that point, yeah, our pyramid might be worse off than, than a lot of kids out there because these kids have the uh, financial means to be able to play their sport all year, which I hate, but that's, that's a whole other episode. Yeah. All right. So what does our school day look like? So our school day is eight periods, 45 minutes. So we have every single class, every single day. And now one of those eight periods is lunch. So really we're talking seven classes a day. Um, so with that, like kids have freshman year PE, Nothing after that. Um, I, I'm, you know, hoping that we can develop some sort of in school. But again, us being a faith-based uh, school, being a Catholic school, one of those, and this is something that public schools don't have, is that one of those eight, so you got one is lunch, the second is automatically some sort of faith-based class. So... For a lot of like public schools, you don't have that. That has the potential of being some sort of physical education where we don't have that. So we are before and after school, which basically translates to everybody after school because we are talking about high school kids, 
freshmen, sophomores can't drive themselves um, for the most part. Um, so really we're looking at, you know, getting – and, and, and we'll break down the schedule here in a second, is getting, you know, several hundred kids in sometimes within two hours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, that was a frustrating part for me is coming from Coach Ken, coming from college, like being able to put together like the perfect – I mean, you know, we might have said that we worked out for only two hours a day. Yeah, okay, that's what we signed on the NCAA logs maybe. But, you know, I'm sure if we actually kept a real time on there, it was longer. But, you know, it, it's it's um, it was frustrating to me to say, hey, I want to do like this much stuff, but really only being able to do about that much stuff. And that was just something that frustrated me at first. But I, I think all coaches out there, I'd, I'd share those feelings. You probably have those feelings as well, is that, man, I'd love to do this, 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 this and this, but we only got – so much time. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what we're really stuck with probably, uh, you know, an hour uh, of work. Some teams are three times a week. Some teams are two times a week and just got to make the, make the best of it. And, and again, still frustrating to me, but those just are circumstances that I'm not going to be able to change. So don't fret over things that are with that, you know, not in your control. I tell my guys control the control, right? There's so many things out there we can't control. And one of those things is going to be the school schedule. No matter what you say, you're not going to be able to control it. They're not going to get rid of, you know, whatever other class to add PE. I hope they do down the road, but I don't see it. So, well, um, and, and, and that makes a really good point, too, because, right, I, I didn't know that about St. X, and I, I could have maybe thought it through a little bit, but, you know, having the your lunch and then having your – uh, faith-based class that you have to go to. Yeah, that, and now you've got four main core classes that you got to go to. So now you're playing with, you know, maybe one. Yeah, you know? yeah. and with and with colleges, and, and again, when I was trying to petition to have an extra PE class or go PE classes all four years, my counselor, you know, we got kids who are trying to apply to top schools. Mm -hmm. um, and they say, look, if – if a, it, it, for some of these schools that are colleges that are highly competitive, if they look on that transcript and see, call it whatever you want, advanced PE, human, you know, whatever, yep. fancy it up all you want. They're going to look at that kid's transcript and they're going to say, why didn't you take AP stats? Yep. Or why didn't you take AP physics? Or why'd you take another, you know, why'd you take the second PE instead of AP Java? Right. So those are the, those are the types of schools that our kids are trying to get into. And so those counselors are not – even though – I'm sure you've talked to the counselors as far as, like, could these kids use more physical uh, time, you know. They, they're they not disagreeing with that. Mm -hmm. They're disagreeing with, hey, our job is to get these kids into Duke or get these kids into Penn or get these kids – I mean, some of the – you know, some of the uh, – even schools that – you know, our councils were wrapping off are highly competitive because they're only taking so many kids from each location, right? They're looking at Louisville and they're saying, we're only taking this number of kids from that area. So that's, not, that's something that I didn't know. So when you come down to it, you're like, okay, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want my kid taking an extra PE class either. Um, if, if that's what it's going to come down to for him being able to get to the school he wants to or not. So, um, well, and you're in a unique situation too, where that those parents are paying for their kid to hopefully jumpstart them to get them to the next level to help them get the next job. But that's how a lot of these parents are thinking of it because yeah. they could go to the, the public school that they're next to. Mm -hmm. They're paying to go to St. X. So they're looking at yeah. those counselors, they're looking at those teachers to say, hey, your job. I am paying you. I'm shelling out money when yeah. I'm still paying my taxes over here to yeah. go to Eastern. And it's nothing against those schools, but they've got right. the money to be able to go and do that. So yeah. it, it makes sense why why you would probably have to push to after school. Okay, so right. let's transition. Let's talk a little bit about some, at, you know, your after school training, different things like that. Yeah. So um, go ahead and pull up uh, kind of your screen there so you can kind of show us a, a, a general outline. But while you're doing it, kind of explain to me your thinking uh, just at, at a very <coughs> – thousand foot overview when you start to sit down uh you've already said we've got a lot of kids that are we need to work on the general 
We yep. maybe don't need to lo- work on a ton of the specific right now because they've yep. already got it. So t- talk to me a little bit about just your overall view. Do we adopt things from Joe Ken with the tier system? Yep. D- different different programming influences there. I think I think one thing. Let me see. Let me bring this up here. Um, all right, we good? Can you see it? Yep, we're good. All right. So I think one thing that. I'm always interested in when I go to conferences and, pe- and coaches are talking about their uh, program is I'm like, okay, what is it? What are the logistics that we have to break down? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just tell everybody watching that this is not going to be the best program. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you're, if you're tuning into the podcast saying, all right, coach Rimes is about to show me like the best high school program ever. You're in the wrong spot. Because what we first have to do is we have to, you know, it's a combination of logistics. What can I get done? Like, you know, how much time do I have? What equipment do I have? Um, What athletes I'm working with? What that schedule looks like? Um, So this is our schedule here. All right, and the and the and the number next to that shows how many racks of each kit. Now. We got a great alumni, all right? So when I look at my office, I, I got like a $500,000, $600,000 weight room, which is going to make most people now listening to this podcast give me the middle finger, and I understand. I If I was in those shoes, I, I would I would too. But again, when you look back earlier at our podcast was that time is limited, mm. and we have about 700 kids in our school who are involved in athletics. Mm. So I have about two hours or so, two and a half hours after school to try to get six to 700 kids in, right? Either three or two times a week. Mm -hmm. So let's just take like a Monday here. All right. Powerlifting. Okay. Varsity soccer, wrestling, hockey, and freshman baseball are all going to be in the weight room at the same time. All right. Now, some of those teams like soccer, they're in season. All right. Uh, uh, hockey, wrestling, they're kind of starting their uh, off season. Well, wrestling's been continuing on. All right. Freshman baseball, they're in the start uh, of their off season program. Uh, then, boom, when we switch over at 415, okay, that's what it's going to look like uh, there. So, again, you could take this number. Six, and you can multiply. We got about six guys per rack. So when you start taking these numbers and multiplying them by six and adding that up, you're getting about 130 kids in the weight room at a time, mm-hmm. which, again, we have the facility to do it, and I'm very, very blessed. And our athletes, whether they know it or not, are very, very blessed, and we have alumni that provide for that. However, that's going to greatly dictate how I am going to program because the same program I could write if I'm only dealing with 20, 25, 30, hell up to 50 kids is a whole heck of a lot different than when I have 130. And, and, and I say this all the time is that our average ACT score, I think here at St. X is like 25.1, I think was the last. That's the average. Now, when these kids get around each other, that average drops to about 5.1. Yep. So I have to write a program and try to make it quote unquote idiot proof for when there's 130 kids down here. So take that into consideration when we're looking at the looking at the programs here. And so yes, if you're familiar with Joe Ken, this is going to look a lot or, or, or look pretty similar uh, to you as far as format. All right, so I'll just go back to kind of week one with our with our baseball guys. So it all starts out movement prep. Uh, so starting out with, uh, you know, some different movements around uh, the weight room again, 130 guys in here. And I'm going to program 130 guys no matter what. If I only have 30 guys in the weight room, we're going to do the same thing because – Again, I don't want to have to differentiate day to day. Okay, well, you're, there's only 30 in here, so I'm going to do something completely different. I want them to know exactly what we're doing essentially every single day. So we'll start off with movement prep work. And what I used to do and what we did when we were in college is if you have a three-day workout, you have three different prep, right? I'm going to prep differently if bench is my tier one exercise as opposed to squat. Mm-hmm. So what that got me into is you just saw that there's going to be five teams in here at one time. 
there's a potential that there's like three different preps going on once we start getting into Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. If these guys are on day two, we're on day one, what have you. So I just say, okay, again, that's just experience and learning and recognizing, quit putting a square peg in a round hole, right? So I keep the same prep work for every single team for typically about four to five weeks, and then I switch it up. Now, it's still going to fall. We're going to do some sort of med ball. We're still going to do some sort of hip abduction. We're still going to do some sort of core exercise. We're going to do some sort of single leg exercise, core stability and push-up, and some sort of shoulder prehab. So that template stays the same where this might be like a forward chop mm -hmm. on a move, you know, the next month. Right. This might be uh, lateral steps with a band. All right. Or it might be hip lifts with a band. All right. This might be side planks. OK, this might be instead of pistol squats on the ground. Now I'm up on a box doing a single leg uh, squat. Hammer release push ups stays the same. All right. Front raise may go to instead of the front raise, it goes to side raise. Mm -hmm. All right. So, again, whenever we're whenever in, in another note out there is whenever you're creating exercises, like you may not call them what the actual exercise name is. Try to make it as easy as possible. So, I mean, again, five point, right? 25.1 drops down to 5.1, right? So front plate raise, and I'll still have kids raising their arms out to the side. Yep. So instead of lateral, I just put side. And some kids still don't know what that is. So just try to, you know, try to simplify as, as much as you can. And I tell kids all the time, I'm like, Fellas, I, I, I coach you all and, and talk to you guys like your kindergartners because guess how you all act when you all get around each other? Kindergartners. So, and that was another that was another one of those things that I had to learn mm -hmm. was just because just because we go to St. Axe, just because we're really, really smart doesn't mean we're really, really smart. Mm -hmm. right? Had kid put in the bench backwards and he was like, oh, I'm in all honors classes. I'm like, just because you're in honors classes don't mean you're smart. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so we got T there's, so this is day one. So if you're familiar with Joe Ken, you got T, you got L and you got U. Now I had to switch these up just because of logistics, right? We have power racks. Um, and so, you know, I, I, let me start here. Our format is going to be A and B. So let's say there's six guys at a rack. Three guys are going to start on A. Three guys are going to start on B. All right, and then I use what I would uh, uh, recommend is a timing system, intervaltimer.com. Uh, um, I would highly recommend coaches out there use this. Uh, like we have screens in our weight room. I recognize everybody may not have that, but even if they're able to just link up to a, um, you know, to a, to a speaker or something like that, just to provide the beep. That way, when I got 130 guys in here, I know that everybody is on set one. I know that everybody in this room should be on set two. Um, so I think adding extra eyes to your weight room is a, excuse me, is a great help when you have those kind of large groups. And I'm so going to add whistle, in. Taking, a, taking eyes to stopwatch, I can let this do it for me. So intervaltimer.com, you can create your own interval timer for, again, whatever works best uh, for you. And I'm going to add into this real quick because I went and listened to your family day talk back in November of yeah. last year. And this was something that you talked about. I took it back to mine and it works beautifully. We got two TV screens. We put it up there. They know where they're at and I know where they're at and we can, and we can move and it keeps them on task. They don't rut. It, the biggest thing that I found was a lot of my kids were rushing through it and yeah. not taking the appropriate rest time. Like yeah. we, had, we had to teach them about what rest time is again, coming from the college level, similar to you. I was like, they're going to know what a rest time is. Like, you're not just going to rush through this. No, they breeze right through and don't ever take a rest. And so when yeah. you get to that top set, it looks ugly. And you're like, well, I'll tell you why it looks ugly. Yeah. Quite too fast. So exactly. Right, continue. Thank exactly. You. Yeah. I had, I had uh, a couple of kids the other day, they were on set six and everybody was on set four and they got pinned for two reps instead of eight. Mm -hmm. And I had to explain to them because a lot of sports are taught, go, 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 go. And I understand that. So there's that delicate balance of I don't want my kids screwing around, right? So some of these I'll put like on B exercises, I'll put something in between because I don't want I don't want kids just standing around. So sometimes on our presses, we'll do some sort of neck and trap work. Um, 
is, is being able to explain to them, look, man, if you're trying to run the best 40 yard dash you possibly can, would it make sense to run a 40 yard dash, get right back up to the line and run another 40 yard dash? What's that second time going to be? And all of them are like, Slow. I'm like, exactly. So there, we want you to take time. That's why I give you a timer. It's idiot proof. Pay attention. Usually it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. So something like that. Um, and then once we get to, so we'll A and B. So let's say we got six guys in a rack. Three are on trap bar, three are on B. We're going to follow that timing system. And then we're actually going to switch. And so on that timing system, I actually allocate time to switch. I mean, every second of our workout is allocated and accounted for. Uh, even cleanup time is on there. Um, now, once we get to what tier system would would uh, would be, you know, the um, uh, uh, tier three, tier four, and tier five, I just have them partner up, and I have them rotate through the five exercises. Right. So that would, you know, I'm always going to have a row. I'm always going to have a posterior chain. All right. And then I switched these two. And now for high school boys, what do high school boys care about? They care about bench press and they care about curls. Mm -hmm. So that was one of those things starting out. I was like movements over muscles. And again, movements over muscles. I got it. But when you're talking to teenage boys, curls. And that was that throw a dog a bone. Like as soon as I threw curls into the workout, I became like the best strength and conditioning coach in the country. You did, yep. I that was it. That was that was it. It what it went from like, but coach, we don't do curls, and I, you know, hey, we do chin ups. You know, we do like all right on this neutral grip pull down, right elbow flexor, you did all that, right on the on the a chin up. That no, but it's not curl. Mm -hmm. And if if that's what it takes to create a little buy in, right? So we're trying to create a fun atmosphere. We're trying. We're wanting that buy in. If it takes someone in freaking curls. Because they're going to do curls, whether it's at their gym or at their house or whatever. They're doing curls. So I threw it in there. I became the best coach. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to partner up and they're going to rotate through. So I know we only got a couple minutes. I got class coming up here. Mm -hmm. So when I look here, again, keeping that same movement prep. All right. So here's my U. This is my T. Right. So I'm using swings and underhand med ball throws for a progression into cleans. Mm -hmm. uh, working on that hip extension, that hinging movement. Uh, and then I got my L, right? I got my pool, got my posterior chain, all right? And then this is my precursor to, or my um, uh, progression into dips, right? Because you got the buys, you got to work the tries, bro. Yeah. Got to work the tries, all right? And then we're going over here to uh, to our day three. Get, again, same movement prep, start them out on front squat, working our vertical presses. So I got you. OK, again, I got to switch the T and the L just for like logistic mm -hmm. uh, reasons uh, with this one. Or I'm sorry, L, U. Never mind. I'm sorry. I'm trying to rush now. That's so right. here's my L. There's my uh, U. OK, combo. All right. With these guys, the T, I, I, I want them doing more lateral movement. All right. Because I thought that the lateral squat looked horrible. So I'm not worried about progressing into cleans right now. I'd rather do a little squat. So, again, just because you're. Make it a, like you got to make it, you got to adapt it to what fits for you. All right. I got my pool. I got my posterior chain. And again, you don't work out unless you do curls. So uh, that is the semblance. And again, that's good. That's every sport. Every sport is going to have that same setup, A and B switch partner up and C. And so again, put that on a timer. There's the bell. If you can hear it, okay. and that's the, um, you know, that's the format for every single uh, – that's the format for every single team who comes in here. So whether that was lacrosse, whether that was wrestling, whether that was uh, 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 freshman baseball that we're looking at here, that format is going to stay the exact same. Um, and then it's just plug and play. So if you're familiar with, with Coach Ken's tier system, man, it's movement categories. And then I'm going to plug and play um, uh, where I need and, and, and where I feel like uh, – um, our team is uh, at that time. Perfect. So this is going to be part two of Coach Taranzo's interview. We had to uh, split this apart a little bit uh, just because both of our schedules uh, didn't allow us to sit down for uh, an hour and 20 minutes. And as strength and conditioning coaches, uh, sometimes we can get on a roll asking questions and talking about programming. So I appreciate, uh, Coach, you coming back on. And uh, we'll try to put this all together as one episode, but we'll let our listeners know that this is two parts. So I appreciate the opportunity to sit down with you again.
Jeremy, good to talk to you too, man. Bye. Hopefully we're able to give uh, everybody out there a couple of uh, tidbits that, you know, they can help improve their program. So absolutely. Hopefully so, from all of this, they're able to get something. Yes, absolutely. So uh, where we left off was you were going through – um, talking about how you implemented the tier system. Now, the one thing that you really latched onto and said that I think would stand out to most audiences is you've got to service a lot of athletes, right? There are at times you've got a hundred kids in there. So the programming template stays the same, but you could potentially see you pulling in or put pulling out or pull, putting in different exercises, but the template is going to stay the same throughout the week. That way it yeah. helps you organize it. So I was wondering if you could dive into that a little bit, maybe show us what, you know, you showed us baseball, I think was what you, what you had us on there first. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe talk to us a little bit about that um, and how that might change sports sport. Yeah, so, it, you know, if, if you've listened to Coach Ken, who, who developed the tier system, if you've listened to him talk, all he talks about really his his definition of the tier system is a daily rotation of movement categories. And so he, he doesn't say exercises specifically. He's talking about the, the categories of movements, right? The total, the lower, and the upper, and, and rotating those as far as their priority. Now, with, and again, to, to kind of refresh, I was fortunate enough to play um, at Louisville while Joe Ken was um, our strength and conditioning coach. And when I say that was a pleasure, it, it, it was. It was also uh, very torturous uh, at times. Um, but, you know, when you're in a college setting, right, so I, I'm thinking back of my lifting groups and you have five full-time strength and conditioning coaches at that level, and I would say that the lifting group I was in, maybe 20, 30 at the, at the most. And we had a 10,000 square foot or so uh, weight room. So in that setting and scenario, it's very easy to now implement and say, okay, we're using the tier system and we're going to do tier one first. And then we're going to do tier two, and then we're going to do tier three, and then we're going to do tier th uh, four, and then we're going to do tier five, and then we're going to do some other stuff. And that's great. It, 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 it works. Now, when you're one coach or you're one coach and an English teacher and a, a geography teacher or a, a paraprofessional uh, coach who's coming in and Though, again, we're fortunate to have, um, you know, 24 racks. When you have 100-something guys in there, you can't go Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, because, again, there, there, there's days, and, you know, we had another one of them yesterday, where you're going to have six guys on a rack. I mean, even if you got 24 guys, if you got 120 kids in there, you know, Putting four to a rack or three to a rack, math doesn't work. So what I do in my templates, and we'll show you here uh, in a second, is that we can't go one to two to three. So we got to kind of, um, you know, modify it, right? Coach Ken also talks about, um, you know, modify and apply, you know, absorb, modify, and apply. So take the tier system, absorb it, right? Absorb and learn the, the reasons behind, the nuances behind um, why he sets it up and why he does what he does, but also recognize, and again, this is me talking to past me at, at this time, right? Is that, look, man, like your, your setup, your logistics that you have at your school are not going to match a Division One program. You're not going to have five knowledgeable coaches on, with 30 kids. You ain't going to have that ratio. Um, so, again, talking to future me, talking to past me, would, would say, look, man, just, just be the best version of what you can be, right? Uh, be, be, develop the best program, but it's okay. Like, you're not going to be able to do it the same way that Joe Ken was able to implement it with you at Louisville. You're not. 
Okay. And that's okay. Just be the best version of St. Xavier high school. Like do that. So it, 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 it took a little bit of time. I even had to, I even had to rotate some things, which I'll show you here in a second. And for some reason, like it just, I thought that was like a rule that, you know, you've got to go in this order and it's not man. You, like it is when you look at the overall system, but look, man, like that doesn't work for your setting. It probably not a lot of schools out there. That system works and you can go bam, 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 and bam. There may be some, but it's not here. Like, you know, I could do that for, for, for a group here or a group there. Um, you know, so like at the 315 time slot when there's a hundred and something guys coming in, I can't do that. But when, you know, somebody comes in in the second slot and there's only 40 or 50 kids in here at a time, all right, we can go in groups of three and go tier one, tier two, tier three. But I wanted to create a system to the worst case scenario because then it's easy as opposed to set it up how it is and then be sitting there like oh crap i don't know what to do but, um and i think that's and i think that's really important here for for most of our listeners or people that are viewing this as well is when they start thinking about this because it works at saint x again just like we said it doesn't work at, you know it works with louisville but it's not gonna work at saint x because it works at saint x it doesn't necessarily mean or again we're just modifying and adapting what we're taking in here right and i think that's key because as we change jobs or as somebody steps into a new job they think, well, if I can, I can just plug and play from the last one. But your setup's probably not the same. But again, I think this is what's so unique about this format and yeah. you know, our discussions is that we're actually able to show people, hey, look, this is what we can do given the racks, given the space, given all of this, and this is what we found what works best. And and you know, again, that's one thing that I really like about high school is it seems like everyone's every single school has a different mm -hmm. scenario and setting. Yes. You know, it, and it, it's it's curious just when you ask different coaches, okay, what do you all have? What's your schedule like? Everyone's is di everyone's is different. Mm -hmm. uh, some drop a class on this day, so they have you know it's like a seven day rotation. Like us again to to kind of go back, we have every single class every single day for forty five minutes, which I have not talked to a lot of coaches like that who. Oh yeah, we have every single class every single day. So it's uh, it, it it it's uh, it's very it's very interesting. So yeah, you you could talk to a hundred schools and you got a hundred different um, uh, scenarios, and uh, that that's what I like about it. And and two, I think we always have to remember is there is no one right way to do this. You know, if there was one right way to do strength and conditioning, bigger, faster, stronger, uh, uh, less likelihood of injury. If there was one way to do it and that was found to be the best way, well, everybody would do it that way. Mm -hmm. But there is no one right way to do it. So, again, just be the best version uh, of yourself. Take your circumstances, your athletes, your weight room, your equipment, your time constraints, and, you know, I wish you, I could give you, hey, this is exactly what you would do in this setting, but – a lot of it, a lot of it's trial and error. I mean, you know, the, the you know, I, I've done it. This is my, this is my, I think, ninth year here. And I'm still like, okay, yeah, that, that, that didn't work. I'm going to, I'm going to try this. Uh, so it's a consistent trial uh, and error. So, you know, we're, we're talking here on uh, uh, September 16th, right? And if you talk to me on September 20th, I might be doing something a little bit different because of something that happens today. I don't know. Um, and again, so we're I'm, always going to be adapting. And again, I'm going to highlight that because I think that's important. Again, now that I've entered into the public school system, they there's one thing that they always refer back to is they they said you might be a 20 year teacher, but did you teach the same way that you were teaching on year one and just repeat it 20 different times, or did you adapt as it went along and did you teach it differently? Because then you have 20 years of experience, or do yeah. you just have one experience repeated 20 times, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's what's so unique, even in a position where you have been able to be, you know, work under, intern under um, a, a great strength and conditioning coach like Joe Ken, you're still modifying, adapting as you continue to go along and what you see fits. And I think, again, if that's one thing that we can impress upon people from, from this, this podcast with you and this video podcast is how important that is. Absolutely. Um, you know, so let me, I guess, go into kind of what we do and explain 
uh, what we do, um, to try to elaborate a little bit more on it. And again, you know, like we just talked about, man, like if we if we talk here next week, I could have something uh, totally, totally different come up. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me see where I'm at. Here we go. Uh, try to share my screen here. All right. Got my screen? Yep. We are all good. good. Yeah. All right. So, um, well, that's the schedule. So, again, kind of giving everybody a, a, a highlight here. You know, this is the number of racks of kids that I have. So, just, you know, let's look at Tuesday afternoon. Okay, I got 10 groups of lacrosse, 10 racks of lacrosse kids. So, go ahead and just say that that's five kids, mm -hmm. right? So, we've, when you got four different teams in here and, you know, you have that number of racks taken multiplied by four or five, that's a lot. So when you're looking at, you know, what we're doing and why I don't do uh, certain things a certain way or whatever, that kind of gives you the overall uh, look at it. You know, I mean, you come in here after that and you have another full house right here. You know, like this is my, I'm trying to think, Friday today is going to be a lighter day. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I, if I could do something completely different, like on Friday with baseball, but why? Why have something go you know, 90% of the time being one way and then, you know, try to try to teach a whole nother thing for for just that one time that you may have them just by themselves, you know, because you know, next week I'm going to have 50 soccer guys in here at that same time. So uh, I just stick, you know, try to stick to the stick to the basics um, and, you know, be brilliant at the basics. I don't think you'd I don't think you'd uh, talk to a coach that could really disagree with that mantra of trying to be uh, brilliant with the basics. So, so what I do is, all right, tier system. All right, so a breakdown of, uh, it's a daily rotation of movement categories. And so when we look here, all right, again, this is one change that I have already, that I have made just from last year, just trying something out and it didn't really work uh, how I wanted it to. So if we look here, we got a three day a week program. Now, uh, what will happen is there's some teams that only come in here twice a week. Um, for instance, uh, hockey uh, right now, two times a week, volleyball right now, uh, two times a week. So what I do is I keep the session one and the session two. Uh, and then once I go um, for, you know, probably a, a month or two, then there are two days a week will be session two and session three. So I'll kind of interchange that. Uh, I've looked at, um, I've looked at also keeping all three and just rotating them. So let's say I got a Monday, Wednesday, um, you know, is that I would do session one on the Monday, then I would do session two on the Wednesday, then I would do session three on the Monday. Um, but, you know, again, with, I think I used this the last time, I got, we, we averaged 25.1 on our ACT, and when they're in a big group, that score drops to 5.1. Uh, so if I can keep something consistent uh, to that way, they're like, oh, well, yeah, I haven't done that workout and. Well, I mean, I haven't done that workout in, in, in 10 or 11 days, you know, and then if you have a, a day like Monday coming up, we have a, a, a PD day. Okay. Well, now it's, you're only doing that every, you know, two weeks. So uh, I've just kind of stuck with that and interchange session one and session three, uh, you know, because if these kids don't bench press, it's not, it, you know, they're, they're not training. Right. So if you don't bench and curl, you know, you're not even doing anything. So I keep session two on there. Again, throwing a dog a bone. Uh, God, it's all about the buy-in. You know, if, uh, if if that's what it takes to get their buy-in is that we bench and do curls. I, I think that's a that's a that's a deal to me. Well, uh, I think, I think this is, I think it's important too. I mean, kids are used to rituals and routines, right? Like when they walk into the, the St. X classroom <laughs> in history, they are going to experience the same thing. Yeah, every day. Now the lesson's going to change, but mm -hmm. it, they're going to experience a similar thing. So when they walk into the weight room, and you talk about this in your warm ups, how you keep the warm ups the same for about a month, right? Yes, they're used to that. They're yeah. used to seeing session one on a let's call it a Monday, just for yes. Monday's sake. They're mm -hmm. used to seeing that. If you yeah. try to start moving that around on them when they come back on that following Monday and they're hitting session three, they're gonna be like, "Well, hang on a second, I'm I'm thrown off. The concentration yeah. goes, and then now yeah. you have to deal with that part." 
Yeah, and I'll get and I'll get kids who uh, you know they they have their own gym memberships. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes as coaches we you know either try to fight doing curls or try to fight doing bench press or do, do, they're gonna do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've seen several coaches say that, like, look, man, they're they're going to go and they're going to max bench. They're going to go and they're going to do, you know, a thousand reps or whatever. Like, wouldn't you rather have them doing that kind of under your watch? Um, so to your to your point, yes, like if they are going to go uh, to the gym on a Sunday, if they are accustomed to saying, OK, well, yes, when I come in on Monday, I'm going to have trap bar deadlift and I'm going to have. Uh, um, incline press, you know, um, so, you know, they're, um, you know, that, that does happen because, you know, sometimes we'll have a, we'll have a storm or we'll have a, a, a schedule change or we'll have something happen and a coach hits me up at noon and says, Hey, can we get in there? And, oh, well, you know, so it's something different something different. And, you know, you'll get a couple guys say, Oh, why, well, you know, I just did that yesterday. Cause usually we don't work out this day or something like that. So um, yeah, good, good point, Jeremy, to you, you know, that, that, you know, those kids who want to do extra work, they'll, they'll start tracking. They'll start realizing, okay, I got this on Wednesday. I got this on Friday, or I got this on Thursday, this on Monday all right, and, and, and kind of work around it. So, uh, so yeah, that, that consistency and knowing what they have um, is a great benefit there uh, for that as well. Um, so even if we look at this, uh, this was, I, I used this for a uh, presentation, it might have been a year or two ago uh, that I'm looking at it, is again, talking about the tier system being in movement categories. Uh, so what I do is I set my overall template, like we've discussed, all right? So my movement categories, right? I got my, my, my tier one, right? My total, my lower and my upper. Now I see, you see this is highlighted orange. I had to flip that. I had to flip that. So if I'm doing, doing a true tier system, I know I have T and then I have L. Well, if T is my primary lift for that day, but they're doing it second because, you know, they start on B first. All right. So let me go over kind of how our system works. If you, if you don't recall from the last uh, last session, uh, let's say we got a group of six, okay, six kids per rack. So we'll go through our movement prep work all together. Three kids will start on A, three kids, excuse me, will start on the B exercise of that day. So, you know, there will be days where they do this one first, or there's days that they'll do that first. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of separate, and I wanted to um, uh, get the L and the T to not be back to back, if that if if that makes sense. So what I did is I switched. So this would normally be T L and then U. So what I did was I took the U and switched it up to here, and took the L and switched it down there. And again, you know that that that's I, I don't think it's crumbling the the, you know, integrity of the tier system. It's just something that logistically uh, I thought that I needed to do. And, you know, the world has kept spinning and everything is fine. You know, again, that was well, me looking back at future me. It, it was it was clear, like, all right, this isn't working. But, oh, no, you know, TLU, TLU, it goes T, then L. Like, what am I doing? Um, I made the switch and everything's been fine. And, again, that's just – Hopefully you were sitting there watching this and being like, yeah, you should have done that. What were, what was your concern? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just letting you know that that was a concern of mine to, to break up the integrity of the tier system. No, so. I think, I think that's a really interesting point. Again, I used the tier system when I was back at center because I only got to see him three days a week. So it worked out perfectly. And that was one thing I always struggled with was when I had to flip flop, you know, we only had X amount of trap bar. So then we had to flip flop, but you know, a, going from a trap bar deadlift or a trap bar pull into a back squat and then switch them and the back squat came into the trap bar pull and it looked like, looked like crap. Right. Um, but I like it. I, it's something I never thought of, but I like how we just move that around. And then it makes sense then when you go to session two and then session three, if, if we start looking forward here, it makes sense. The integrity never fights with each other, right? Their upper body horizontal press on session two isn't going to mess with their clean and it, vice versa. And then the same thing when you get to the L and the U on, on a, on a Friday or whatever our session. Yeah. Are. And it would be, you know, you could probably keep it the same if you could say, all right, this group of three, you guys are always going to do 
A first, and then you are always good. But 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 good luck. I mean, if 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 you really want to track try to track hundreds of kids and letting them know, I mean, I'll do rack assignments for some, uh, for some teams. But you know, if that if that's a if that's a battle that you want to fight, cool, have at it. I just switch this, and it's been fine. And so, what I've also done is that I also wanted to make sure that when I'm going through and doing these exercises, that they're not uh, conflicting with space, hmm. right? So uh, for some, for here, the area and implement template is that I, I will actually kind of do this first when I originally designed the structure and the template of this program is I put down the exercises, okay, or I'm sorry, the movement categories, but then I also put down, okay, what bars are going to be getting used and what where it, in space should I be doing this? Uh, because I did not want to have, you know, back squat being outside the rack because I needed this to be inside the rack. And I actually make, made a change because of that. Um, so you normally this would be, you know, my, my level two um, press. And for me, that was incline. Well, what I did was I I couldn't really get a spotter in there on incline because I would have the squat being inside the rack. And I didn't like how, you know, you had a spotter and a squatter back to back. And so I just switched. I brought horizontal press, right? So for my incline, I brought that over here. All right. And then I took my overhead press, which really don't need a spotter You're outside the rack right? They're facing uh, the squat rack. So they're clear. Everybody's clear from the squat guy. And I switched those two. And the world has kept spinning. Everything's been fine, you know? So, uh, so now again, like this was a, this was an old template. I mean, so if I go deadlift here, I, you know, I'm going to go ahead and change it. This is incline here. All right. And this is overhead, you know, and there we go. It still matches the same movement categories but you know we just had a trial and error there i tried to you know do the incline and it just didn't work okay well i'm still holding the integrity of of the tier system i'm just switching the different movements because logistically for us that just works out now if you're able to go you know on a friday if you're able to go l and then you're able to go then t well then it doesn't matter then you Incline right there inside the rack, and you got plenty of room to spot. But if you got six guys at a rack, hey, you know you gotta gotta switch it up. Gotta gotta find a way to logistically make it happen and 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 keep the kids safe. So you know, so I had that down here. Um, you know, it's kind of breaking down the area of the template. You know, the trap bar. All right. So if I do anything for you, I know I can't use the trap bar. So this kind of helped me help give me an idea of what my template was going to look like. Um, and then you went, when we get down here to C, we partner up and we rotate through those four exercises. So, Jeremy, if me and you were partnered up, you know, I do a set, you know, let's see here. So let's start up. Uh, let's start up here. So I would do a set of lunges. You would do a set of lunges. All right. Now we go and do a set of pulls. I do a pull. You do a pull. All right. I do a posterior chain. You do a posterior chain. All right. I do a curl. You do a curl. And then we're back up to the top. So when I'm going and I'm how many times will we rotate through? So I, I put it I put it on time. So we have a timer. I'm glad to, uh, that actually let me show you that is that here here is our timer, right? So our prep work when we go through we have six minutes. And again, this is intervaltimer.com. Um, I, I think it is. I mean, Team Builder I think was probably the biggest game changer uh, for us as far as just you know big help for our program um and then the timer was second and this timer is free so there you go um so we'll have the prep work there you know so we'll rotate through on the prep work for six minutes i account for a minute of setup time so as soon as prep work is over these guys should already be set up because when they come to their racks they sign in i say all right set up a and b Right, so the you know the squat bar should already be where it is. The overhead press bar should already be where it is. The trap bar should already be out. Whatever. All right, and then I have set one. That's a warm up set. Set two, warm up set. All right, here's our working sets. Six, and then we have actually time to switch. 
right? So that when I get down here to uh, C, all right, here's our partner up. All right, partner up, partner up. We're going to C, get a partner, get a partner, get ready to go and go. All right, and they're just going to rotate through in that fashion that I went over for 15 minutes. All right, and then boom, clean up time. So could we could we potentially see like a group that's maybe a little bit more efficient? Would they get through like four sets of that and maybe another group get through five? Yeah, I mean, pro- volume- probably. But yeah, I, I would say three or four sets. Okay. Uh, there are times that, you know, guys are going to have to wait on equipment a little bit, like a glued ham or a pulley or something like that. Um, so whenever we go off the timer, you know, if, if it's a, you know, they don't come in until – you know, the team is in season or they're doing a little something different, like basketball is doing some drill work and stuff. So instead of coming in right when that second session starts, they come in a little bit after. I just tell them three sets. When you get to see, go three sets. That makes sense. Um, but again, still done in that same format. A, A, B, switch, partner up, C, three sets. Gotcha. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and again, I, I I think we said this in our last one, but I, I'm going to reiterate here that I went to family day, got to see you present and you presented on this and it, it is a game changer. The kids like it, but I think it's interesting. If you go back just so people can see this, because I think this is another important part is on your, uh, sorry, on your interval timer there. If you can go back to the start where you're setting up a and B and then you go into your first a and B, if you look at the time here for, a, uh, click on the A or B set one there, you've got two minutes. Like re- rest time is important here that we need to be able to factor in here. And we need to make sure that we are integrating that into our program. Now you do have three people that need to get through. So you're yes. accounting, you are accounting for that. And generally speaking that. Group- yeah. So I, the, the, wor- the worst thing I think we can do is have kids with downtime. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I want it to be a delicate balance of we want to provide good rest, but we also want to keep it moving. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is a warm up. Set one is a warm up. I expect it you know, to, to go quick. The weights aren't going to be uh, uh, significantly different from each other. You're going through fast. So set one, two minutes. Set two, three, four are two and a half minutes, okay? So set two is still kind of a warm-up. Set three, I call them our working sets. Now, when we get to set five, I actually allow three minutes because I want to give them just a little bit more rest because set six is going to be our heaviest set. Mm -hmm. So set five is our longest set to give them an extra 30 seconds of rest uh, because a lot of those on those set six, that will be, you know, those AMAP sets or something like that. So I want to give them a little bit uh, more rest time. Um, Now, full transparency here, I think the two and a half sometimes, depending on the exercise, like for bench is fine for squat, for deadlift. It's it's too short. But again, like I want the sense of urgency. You know, when you get, when you, you know, your groups who are like working really hard and like they are getting every single possible rep they can, those are the groups that are going to be slightly behind, which I understand that I'm fine with. Now, I'm still going to tell them, gosh, we got to hurry up. Mm -hmm. Like, I I understand. Um, But if anything, I I don't want, I'm I'm not going to put four or five minutes in between sets. I, I realize that that would be, you know, if I'm, if I'm uh, really trying to work on max strength, yes, I, I realize that, you know, I probably need to give them more than that rest time. But again, thinking about, thinking about our sport, how many times do I really get to like sit and wait around and rest. Plus, uh, you know, if we're, if we're thinking about, okay, who's our clientele here, teenage boys for me, Teenage boys, I don't want them just standing around for for five minutes. Um, I have a limited amount of time. You know, I I got this, this. So if I go at the very beginning, 55 minutes. So every single second is accounted for. Once we start, it's 55 minutes. I don't have an hour and a half. Uh, Some of the workouts that we would do in college, I mean, we would time them. And they those workouts, tier one through tier five, they would be an hour and a half. We as high school coaches, I doubt there's very many out there who really have an hour and a half to do that. So, 
yes, I understand why we would want to give them more rest time. And on max days and things, we don't do the timer. I say, hey, take a little bit more rest time in between. Uh, you know, when we get down maybe to that set week or two before max days, I may say, you know, I may hit the pause on the timer. I feel like we're falling a little bit behind. Hey, that's fine. We're going to take an extra minute right here, rest, recover. Uh, but for 95% of the time, urgency, 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 urgency. I want them, I want them moving. I don't want them stopping. I uh, want to keep them focused. And downtime is a great way for them to lose focus. I said, you, you all should either be lifting, spotting, or loading the bar. Or, you know, I'll, I'll throw in, um, you know, some other exercises we can take a look at uh, here in between, um, you know, to kind of fill that rest time so we're truly not standing around. Yeah. Okay, so we got about 10 or so minutes here left before we've got to break apart again. It feels like it feels like this time is flying, so I, I do appreciate it. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the last thing that I wanted to try to get to, if, if you could help the listeners understand is, so you've got your programming template that you have for exercises. And then we start talking about, you know, percentages or intensities and then sets and reps. How do you start thinking about that in the setting that you're in, things that you're trying to accomplish? What, what does that look like for either you and you're thinking about it, And then how do you deliver that to the kids so that they can, you know, because again, I work with high school kids, you get a high school male, Man, it might say six reps, and all of a sudden they they've got a one rep max bench that they've got going on. So, how do you start thinking about that? Explain it to them, and then kind of go off that for me. Yeah. So, I mean, just the other day. Uh, so let me let me kind of get here uh, again. Team builder game changer for us. Being able to uh, put their weights, and I, I call it idiot proof. Um, as you said, with teenage boys, nothing is, um, but I do the best I can. Mm -hmm. And so we'll just kind of walk through here again. So on our movement prep, like the categories, like the stations are going to stay the same. Again, wanting that consistency, I may switch up the exercises every month, month and a half, mm -hmm. right? But we're still going to have a shoulder Right, we're still uh, uh, hand release push ups is consistent. We're going to have a core, we're going to have a single leg, we're going to have some sort of hip abduction. All right, we're going to have some sort of med ball throw. That will be that six minute prep. All right, so now if I quick open here on bench press, what I love about Team Builder is you do have the option to be able to provide uh, percentages. All right, and then on, so you were talking about kind of the sets, the reps, all that. So my first two sets, they are our uh, warm up reps. Uh, those are our warm-up sets. I'm sorry. Uh, we're on sixes here, and then I can put down the certain percentages uh, with this. Now, with bench press, I know that those are going to be uh, max effort. Uh, I know that those numbers are going to be very, very accurate because when you say go to a set of failure with a kid on bench press, you know that he's going to go to a set of failure oh, yeah, on yeah. bench press, right? So what this enables us to do is that, all right, if I put in 82%, you know, six to 10 reps, he is able to go in and type in, all right, how many reps did I get? And Team Builder will recalculate uh, that max number for him. Now, what I will do sometimes, to your point, is I'll do this. I'll leave it blank. Because I want to give the kids the opportunity to, again, knowing that we fluctuate day to day, I want to give them the opportunity to kind of pick their own weight. But I say, all right, listen, fellas, we're in that six to 10 rep range. So depending on how set five feels, you may want to stay at that same weight or you may want to move up a little bit. So, again, I think it's important for us coaches to, 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 to realize and kind of uh, be proactive with our explanations. So I'll even say, now, if you're at 120, do I want you to then jump to 135 so you can have the big plate on, right? Yeah, 135, I've arrived, I'm huge, and then get crushed or only get one rep. No, I want six to ten reps. So if that means going to 125, then go to 125. 
So I just had it happen with a soccer player. I, I think I pretty much had this same setup here. I left this blank. I said six to 10 reps. And I think for this soccer player, it was 95 because our 25s are the big ones, right? The big bumper plates. So he wanted to, of course, put the 25 pound plate on there, you know, cause it's a big bumper plate. And what do you do? He got crushed. And so, you know, that's one of those, <sighs> Listen, I understand you want the big plate. I got that. Oh, I thought I could get it. You thought you could get it once. What were we supposed to do? Yes, yeah, six to 10. So we, you know, every coach out there is probably shaking his head like, yep, this happens at my school too. So thank you. I thought I was the only one, but, you know, it's kind of like counseling, right? The more coaches you talk to, the, it's like, okay, good. It's not just me. Yeah. Um, so that is how I will go in and progress. Now you can actually, you can uh, put a setting here on Team Builder that won't let their weights drop. So if they have a bad day and, you know, let's say that this was 82% and they only got three reps of it, but it was a bad day, like it's not going to drop their weights. That's a setting that you could put on it. Gotcha. Um, you know, the only bad side of that is that sometimes they hit one digit too many. So their 120 becomes 1,200. Yep. And you got to go back in like, coach, uh, my bench is set at 1,600 pounds. I'm like, sweet, bro. It's awesome. Uh, okay, let me let me go get that fixed. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword there. But I tell you what, it, it's been a game changer for us. And while I'm on the subject, I know some guy like this program for us costs $1,800 a year. We get 1,000 viewers or a thousand users. And I, I recognize that some budgets out there, you're like, no chance. Mm -hmm. So what I did initially was I went to our IT department to get this funded. And, you know, for 1800 for athletics might be like no chance, but for IT, a lot of times $1,800 or, you know, there's less packages there, a thousand dollars, a few hundred, um, some of that money is is a, is a drop in the bucket when you start factoring in, okay, it's technology. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also say, okay, this kid's going to use this for the whole year. And at the worst, it's a dollar eighty a student. Yeah. And they're going to use this the whole year, all four years. I think that becomes uh, more feasible in a conversation with your technology uh, uh, department and, and to be able to get funding. So I uh, just want to throw that out there. Now, one thing that I like, Two is that if you go and like let's say squat, so the, our guys are still kind of acclimating here. Uh, this is only like week number two or three uh, for them. But we talked about earlier on bench, right? Those bench numbers are going to be accurate. But I can't, I, I can, I can't count on like a hundred hands how many times we've gone to uh, test on front squat or back squat or trap bar, and the kids are like, coach, like, like my my trap bar is like. 60 pounds heavier than what was projected or coach like I tested 50 pounds over my back squat number and I'm like oh good job so what you're telling me is and then you start seeing them and they start like oh crap yeah what that means is I haven't been doing the work I've been slacking so like they're initially proud but then you catch them yeah. so one trick is that when I when I'm doing a workout, right, like, okay, I might have like 82 in here. So if I get a collective group of kids that, you know, I'm going through, I'm like, fellas, we got to move our weights up. Like, that's too light. Like, that's too light. That's a, We look good. Why aren't you doing that? I'll do something like this. Right? And I'll just move all these numbers up on my end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'll get six on that last – they'll get six on that last set. But what they don't know is now that's going to bump their numbers 5%. Yeah. They should not be able to do six reps at 90%. Yeah. They don't know that. Mm -hmm. So if you're finding that group that you think is, you know, kind of underperforming, you're having to like push, add, add weight, add weight, you know, all that. When you get to those maxes, those six to 10 reps, you know, they stop and say there's, they're, they're stopping at the reps that are, hard not to fail you know so that's a way that um i can get everybody to bump their numbers five percent without them really even knowing it 
So then when I come back the next week, they're like, oh, man, my numbers, like, jumped, like, 30 pounds. I'm like, oh, yeah, good job, man. You know, so, you know, they, they don't know that. And then they're like, oh, man, the, the workout this week was, like, really difficult. I'm like, yeah, it's because you guys are finally doing the numbers that are appropriate for you. So yeah, slacking. Wow. So uh, that's what I, you know, that that's one great benefit of of this is, is just tracking the numbers and then being able to prescribe uh, weights that are appropriate for them. That's awesome. And so now when we're looking at that, right, you should have, uh, you know, you got your warm up sets of 10, eight, and then it looks like you went sets of six. Is it one of those things? I know I'm oversimplifying a, a very complex uh, thought process that you're having, but when you're working, let's say with baseball that you got here, I mean, are we going to go pretty linear for the first couple of weeks as they continue to work through this program, figure out movement patterns, stuff like that? Like, we'll go sets of six. And are we sticking with sets of six for a, yeah. for a month? Yeah, I'll, 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 st I'll, I'll uh, uh, stay with sets of six. Um, you know, I was, again, listening to, to, to Joe Kid talk, and he was like, it, you know, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly what he's saying, but it was somewhere along the lines of, you know, kids not having the the focus to have great technique and be able to do it correctly for a long period of time. So, um, I'll keep I'll keep all of my I'll keep all of my working sets uh, the same. So yes, I'll just kind of increase the the percentages from uh, week to week uh, up until I get to that uh, six to ten rep range that then kind of sets. So if I went here, and then I went here, all right, then once we get to, you know, set four, or I'm sorry, week four, I'll go six to 10, and that will be kind of the first time that we'll recollect or kind of update those uh, max numbers. Um, and then with the percentages, I, you know, I may stay there for another week, uh, and then we'll start moving down to fives and we'll move down to fours and, and so on and so forth. But it looks, it looks like, it looks to me, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. And again, I know I'm just getting a snapshot of it, but the initial squat, uh, bench, I mean, you're looking to develop a, you know, a max strength quality in there. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. I, I think with. I think with these kids, like, um, you know, one, not having the, you know, not having, you know, I, I'm not going to do hypertrophy work. I'm, I'm going to, you know, and, and I, and I was, and I, I kind of went uh, back and forth on this is okay. I, and I have done it before to where, you know, I will, um, you know, start, start, um, you know, increasing time under tension, right? So I may stay with, I may stay with, uh, with sets of six, um, but then I'll start manipulating, you know, so for the first couple weeks, it would be, you know, three seconds on the down. And then for the next few weeks, it would be three second down with a three second pause at the bottom. And, and so I manipulate sets of reps like that. And again, I just kept coming back to, keeping it simple. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I will t come down here and I had been thinking about it as well as like I, you know, said at the, at the beginning is, is I was, um, you know, it may be different on, on September 20th, mm -hmm. you know, and one thing that I have been looking at because I, I consistently have to go through and say, all right, hold three seconds at the chest. Mm -hmm. Or I used to have to go and be like, Hey, this is a three second down. Like, no count like spotters count out loud. And so, you know, I go back to it like this. These are things that I discuss, like we'll bring it up. I'll have it on the screen. I'll discuss it. I'll say, all right, spotters, you're counting one, two, three. But again, when they disperse out, like I'm not whenever I come around, like I'm not here. Now, again, if I have a bunch of coaches like football does a great job. I can do it with football because football has probably five or six coaches at every single workout. Mm -hmm. So it becomes easier. You have more mouthpieces there being able to say, hey, count, count, count. So there's things that I can do like with uh, with football that are a little bit different um, to – to, to make that, to, to uh, add in the eccentrics, I did add in the isometrics, manipulate that time, do some power work because I have more voices uh, there, uh, coaches that have been in the weight room 
um, for a longer period of time and kind of understand uh, what we're looking for and looking to do. But again, you know, when it when it's one on fifty, you know, by the time I work my way back around, like, and these, and, and and it's smart kids too. Like, it's not like they're you know the whatever. So. You know, when, when I got into it, the more I was just like, okay, we're 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 gonna we're gonna work our strength. We're gonna keep the reps very very similar. I'm just gonna manipulate the percentages on the back end uh, to kind of accumulate up. We may go up to eights or something like that, uh, and then work our way uh, back down. Um, but a lot of times, you know, with that, when you start getting twelves, fifteens, if you are looking to do uh, a higher volume, um, you, you can just tell the, the 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 lack of focus. And again, that that goes back to 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 Coach Kidd talking about. I don't think he prescribed anything over six, uh, maybe to his guys. Um, so that's what you're that's what you're seeing there. Um, a lot a lot of our kids are just, you know, they're just weak. You know they they don't have uh, you know they they don't have the 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 hormones to really grow that muscle yet anyway. Um, so you know I want to focus on uh, the movement patterns. I want to focus on on uh, the strength, the coordination, uh, the stability, the balance. Um, so that's why when you go and you'll see. Um, you know, again, just trying to keep my movement pattern simple, trying to keep my uh, movements uh, simple and just really attacking uh, strength. My, my C's, what I did have was staying at that exercise to try to add more of a, a, a hypertrophy uh, a stimulus. But now I just have them uh, rotating through. Uh, I think too many kids were, were spending more time on the curls than actually rotating through everything else. So that's where I scrapped it and just said, all right, we're going to rotate through. Um, and so again, on September 16th, that's where I am. It could change next week, but, uh, you may have heard Jeremy. That was the, that was the bell for me. And so another 45 minutes is coming gone, man. I know it's been great. Okay. I'm going to make you do this one more time. Uh, coach, as we wrap up, tell listeners how they can reach out to you, follow the work that you've been doing, uh, at St. X. Yeah. Uh, so Jay Tronzo at St. X.com, uh, is the best way to, uh, to get in touch with me. I'm not really a social media guy or anything like that. Uh, but please uh, reach out to me via email and I'll get back to you. I apologize if I don't, you know, he, Jeremy was emailing me and it was getting caught in our school's filter and we had email back and forth. So if I, if I get the email, I'll respond. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready and willing to, to sit and have a discussion with anybody. You know, the, again, one of the reasons why, I do what I do is because I would not have been able to play at the level that I played with. I would not have been able to accomplish what I accomplished um, without the weight room. And I got into this industry to provide that opportunity to other kids like myself uh, who wanted to maximize their potential and, and, and reach opportunities that maybe just their God given ability uh, won't naturally um, put them in a situation to do those. So, uh, yeah, please, uh, please reach out to me and, uh, uh, glad to help any and all throughout the bluegrass. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. All right. See you. Yep.